seen the red roses can't wait for father's day can't imagine what we're gonna get you know i think i know but anyway uh, i hope you enjoy your day i hope if your mom is still with you that you take an opportunity today to to maybe call her or, or get in touch with her maybe you've already done that and just let her know how special she is to you uh, we'd, we'd all be lost without our moms but uh, it's a great day it's a great day to be here, a great day to worship God, and we are so thankful that you've chosen to come and be with us today. And those that are joining us, we're back doing our Facebook Live. Uh, if you know of someone that maybe would like to watch that, let them know of that, uh, that every every week at 10 we come on on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and that you can watch us live. But we're so excited. We've got a number of visitors with us. If you are visiting, there's a card in the pew in front of you. It says Connect on the top of it. If you don't mind filling that out, drop it in the collection plate when it goes by, and uh, we'll have a record of that. Also, there's prayer cards in the pew. If you have a special prayer request you'd like for the elders to be aware of uh, that we can be praying for, feel free to fill that out and also put it in the collection plate. Well, let's get ready to praise God. Let's be standing if Bo comes to lead us. I cannot today what tomorrow may bring in showers and shower rain. The Lord I know will forever repay and all my worry is vain.
scripture reading comes from Psalms 84, verse 11 through 12. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Let's sing together. Be not dismayed, whatever be mine. God will take care. Gracious and heavenly Father, good morning. We thank you this day. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here together in your church. Father, we pray for each and every one of this family, that those that are sick, those that are hurting, uh, those that are in need, Father, of your touch in any way. We invite you to be with us this morning. Father, I'd ask that you would help us to be present, to be where our feet are today, that we'll be here with a purpose to celebrate and to worship you. Father, we ask for your guidance, your protection, that you would keep us, help the meditations of our heart, the words of our mouth be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. My Jesus knows when I am lonely, he knows his he sees his fear, he
turn your attention to the screens, you can see the ways that and different opportunities that we have to give this morning. But while you do that, I, I want to run something by you real quick. If, if, and we're not going to do this for sake of time, but if I had passed out a piece of paper to each one of you this morning and a pencil and it said, write down, let's do a word play on the word blessed. I'm going to write blessed at the top of the paper. And you, just, you just fill in what that word means to you. And we collected those pieces of paper, and I stood up here and I read them individually. More than likely, if you're like me, you would write the ways that you are blessed. Maybe it's the country that you live in. Maybe it's the part of the country that you live in. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family. There would probably be some unique answers to that question, but I think collectively we probably would have a lot of the same answers. Somebody asked me this question the other day, and, and that's why I'm sharing it with you, is what I didn't think about is how I can be a blessing to other people. It's all about how I'm blessed and what I get and what I get to do and the things that I have. But what I never thought about when we had this conversation was how do I take what I have and use it to bless other people? If you came here today not prepared to give, there's nothing that I can say to convince you to use one of these avenues on the screen to give. If you're not prepared to give this week, but I have a challenge for you. I want you to think about that little piece of paper this week. Think about the word at the top. And mentally or, or, or physically write down things on that piece of paper of ways that you can be a blessing to other people. And next week, when you see the same slide and somebody's different standing up here before you, I want you to think about that piece of paper again. And maybe you will feel led to use one of these ways to bless other people. Today, let's give thanks for the blessings that we have and the blessings that God has given us to share with other people. God, we're thankful. Sometimes we don't show it. Sometimes we don't act like it. But we're thankful. We're thankful for the blessings that you give us, the physical blessings, more importantly, the spiritual blessings. But right now, God, we pray that we will search ourselves to give in a way that will be pleasing and honorable to you. We pray that you will take these blessings, these gifts, this offering this morning, that you will put it in the men's hands that will distribute these things and they will do it in a way that will spread the borders of your kingdom and that lost souls will come to know Christ. Bless us this morning as we give, bless the gift, and then it may be used to your glory. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Yes, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me hope and saving my soul.
sing the Apostle song, give our kids a chance to come forward and contribute to the, the work we have going on in Jamaica. Jesus called them one by one, Peter and Peter, James and John, days, hadn't we? Those days that we will never forget, whatever that might be. It may be today. It may be Mother's Day. It may be the greatest Mother's Day you ever had, and you'll never forget it. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was the day that your children were born. Whatever it might be, there's that day, that special day that we will always have in our minds, that we'll always remember, that will stick out to us as one of the greatest days 
of our lives. Today we're going to relive one of the greatest days in the life of Abraham. Now, I'm sure Abraham had a lot of great days to remember. But if you were to ask him to point out one of the greatest days of his life, I think on his list somewhere would be the day that we're going to read about in Genesis chapter 22. So I invite you to open your Bibles there today, Genesis chapter 22, as we revisit the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's also from this experience that we learn one of the famous names for God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Let me say this, that there, there, you know, there are certain verses in the Bible that, that we hold on to. I, I call them life verses. There's those verses that we go to that help us through tough times, that encourage us, that uh, remind us really of what's really important. And I think one of those verses is found here in, in Genesis chapter 22. We'll see it in a, in a few minutes. But before we unpack Genesis 22, we need to understand how we got here. In chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis really is, is the storyline of the Bible. God created everything and he created man. and He put man in charge of everything and he had this wonderful relationship with man. But man, instead of picking rule and relationship, decided that he would choose sin and rebellion. And all fell apart. The world was in chaos. The world was spinning out of control and needed a Savior. And a big question comes from all of this. What will God do? What will God do to help rescue and to redeem his creation? Insert Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, we read how that God promises Abraham that he would make a great nation out of all of his descendants. But here's the problem. Weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, and years turn into decades, and there's still no descendants of Abraham. But after 25 long years, God, as he always does, fulfills his promise, and Abraham and Sarah have a son. Now, by the time you get to Genesis 22, things are really good. I mean, this is a happy family. They have planted their roots. They have been blessed. Uh, Abraham and Sarah have their dream child, and all is good in life. Genesis 22 verse 1 says, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, I want to pause here for a second and point out a couple of things. Number one, the text here says that God tested Abraham. I think that's very important to note because we live in a world today where there's this health and wealth gospel that's presented that says God loves you and so nothing bad will ever happen to you. That somehow the idea of God's love for you and a comfortable life are synonyms of each other. And that is simply not true. Life can be cruel. And things do happen in life. And sometimes those things are a result of possibly God testing us. Now, the second thing I want to note here is that to this point, for 10 chapters, Abraham has been faithful. He has left everything and everyone that was comfortable, followed faithfully, waited patiently, it seems like every time that God called Abraham, he asked him to leave something, to give up something that he uh, cherished, to, ex to attempt something impossible. I, I think if I was Abraham at this point, I would, I would feel like Bilbo, when Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings comes to him and he says, I want you to go with me. And his answer was, nope, I have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. <laughs> I think I might feel that way if I was Abraham by now. God has called on him over and over again. He has responded over and over again. And here in verse 2 he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now the obvious question is this. 
why in the world would God ask this guy to do such a thing? And we could really preach an entire sermon on that. But the simple answer is this. God knew that he was never going to allow Abraham to take the life of Isaac. And here's how we need to approach this. Isaac represents that one thing in your life that you love the most. That one thing that you treasure the most. That one thing that means more to you than anything else. And God has said to Abraham and God has said to each one of us, are you prepared to love me completely and unconditionally? Are you willing to give me access to whatever it is that you love the most and that you hold on to the greatest? And so I have to ask you, what's that thing? What's that one thing? What is it, that one thing, that if if God was to ask you right now, I want you to give that to me, and your grip would start to tighten? Maybe a relationship, maybe a future plan, maybe where you live or or maybe where you work. And God says, look, take that career that you love so much. Take that recreation that you love so much. Take that status that you love so much. Take that good thing that you've turned into a God thing and give it back to me. Because if you don't, It will end up destroying your life because it will find a place in your life that will carry weight that it should have never carried. And so the story continues in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of the young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and, and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now some people look at this verse and they think, he left early in the morning. That was immediate obedience. And that may be, may be true. But it's possible that Abraham was sneaking out before he had to tell Sarah what was going on. I mean, I don't want to envision Abraham walking in the kitchen and saying, by the way, me and God had a talk. He wants me to kill the kid, and we're heading out in the morning. I'm not sure that will work out. I'm going to give Abraham a little credit here, okay? But the story continues in verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw the place from afar, and then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, this is the first time in all of Scripture that we find the word worship. And I think it's interesting to look at the context in which Abraham uses that word. And I think it's worth noting that worship will cost you something. And it should cost you something. Your time, your talent, your treasure. Now the servants are left behind and and it's just Abraham and Isaac. And the weight of obeying God has to be coming down on Abraham. I can't imagine what he's thinking now. There has to be some doubts. There has to be some second thoughts. There has to be countless reasons to stop. But yet Abraham continues to trust in God. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Now I have to confess that that I used to read this story and I used to think that, that at this point in time, Abraham has reached a point that he understands that God somehow is going to provide a substitute for Isaac. But I don't think that's the case. What I really think is happening here is Abraham is thinking God has provided the lamb and the lamb is Isaac. And then in verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
Now, if you're hearing this story for the first time, you have to ask yourself the question, why in the world would this man go through this? But you have to look at it from the perspective of Abraham and the whole life of Abraham. As I already mentioned, the fact that Abraham has already experienced God over and over and over again <coughs> excuse me, as a God who always keeps his promise. The Hebrew writer gives us some insight into Abraham's reasoning. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of the offering up of his only son, of whom it was said, through, <coughs> through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Now, you talk about faith. Up to this point, how many people have God raised from the dead? Let me give you a hint. Zero. He couldn't look to Jairus' daughter. He could not look to, to, to uh, the widow's son. He couldn't look to, to Lazarus. He chooses to obey because he is trusting in an all-powerful God who has always kept his promise and has always provided. And if you're familiar with the story, you know how that Abraham takes the knife, he draws it back, and the angel of the Lord stops his hand. There's a ram in the thicket, and Isaac is spared. And then we get our life verse. Here's our life verse, verse 14. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. What an incredible story, one that we've heard a number of times. But there's a lot of applications in this story that we can apply to our lives and our situations. And let me give you some take-homes. The first one is this, that God provides in his time. I don't know how many of you are planners. To a certain degree, we're all planners, right? But some people are planners on steroids, I guess you could say. Now, my idea of going on vacation is this. You throw some clothes in the bag, you zip up the bag, you throw the bag in the car, and you leave. But some people have to plan out every outfit for the whole vacation, right? Now, I'm not talking about anybody in particular here, okay, so don't read nothing into this. But you, you, you have to plan it all out. You've got to have all the outfits for every situation, contingency outfits for those situations. Now, my idea is that agenda and vacation do not go together. Those two words don't belong in the same sentence. But other people like to plan out their vacation. They like to plan every single detail. Here's where we're going. Here's where we're staying. When we're getting up, where we're going. All those things are all planned out. Nothing wrong with that. But I am sure that Abraham would have loved to have known every single detail of what God was up to and what God was going to do and how he was going to do it before he ever climbed up that mountain. And if you're a planner, you, you, you have a difficult time sometimes because God calls us to do things and to go places and to be involved in things, and he doesn't always give us the details. In fact, the prophet said this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. I like this quote. It says, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Listen, folks, this story is not about having more faith, exercising more faith, believing better and trusting more. This story is all about the object of our faith. Abraham's faith was in God. And it's then and only then that we can find the peace that we're looking for when we don't know the particulars, when we don't know the details, when we don't know how this thing is going to work out. Remember, we all have a temporary viewpoint of the situation. God has an eternal perspective and the implications of that. And that's why Abraham was so confident in his obedience, because he knew who he was obeying. Let's go back to verse 2. It says, he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the mount land of, uh, of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, a better interpretation of, of that word land is region, okay? So we're talking about an area. He says, I want you to take your son and go to this region, and when you get there, I'll tell you which mountain to go on. You talk about being vague? God's being a little vague here, okay? Go over there to this certain area, and when you get in that area, there'll be some mountains, and when we get there, I'll point out to you where you're going to go. Now, most of us will say, well, wait a minute now. I need Let's narrow this down a little bit, God. Help me out, okay? Where exactly in the region do I need to go? I need to plug this in the GPS to get there, right? And you can go ahead and tell me what mountain I'm going on. It's okay. But that's not what he did. But Abraham didn't question it. He got up, and that's where he went. And oftentimes, we want the final destination before we're ever willing to take that first step of faith in our dedication. How many times has God given you a direction without a destination? How many times has God given you a region without any specifics? How many times has God given you a promise without a place? God provides, but God does it in his time. And secondly, he does it in his way. There's a method to the madness. Go back to verse 12. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. When things get hard and difficult in our life, in our minds, do we begin to think about the miraculous ways in which God can bring about his faithfulness through all this? Or do we begin to have a pity party about what's happening that leads to us failing in radical obedience? If you come to know God as the provider, you have a peace as a believer knowing knowing that all of these things that happen are mere portals through which God can reveal his faithfulness. All Abraham knew was this. He knew that God had planned a future through Isaac, and he knew that God asked him to go on a mountain and offer up Isaac. And he can't reconcile the two, but he obeys God anyway. That's faith. That's faith. And hear me, church. What drove Abraham up that mountain that day was not the mere strength of his own faith. It wasn't Abraham saying, I can do this. Rather, it was the strength of God's character and God's faithfulness in his life. I had not been coaching very long. Come home from a long day, my phone rang. On the line was one of my players. And he said, "You, you need to Coach, you need to get over to this young man's house. He named his name. And I said, well, what's going on? And he revealed to me that that day that young man went home from practice and he found his mother who had taken her life. Now, the irony of all of this, I guess, if there's any irony to it, was the fact that I had spoken in chapel just a few days prior to that and I would actually talked about Abraham and I would actually talked about Mount Moriah And I actually talked about the fact that in life, many times we have to face mountains. and We have to to go up those mountains and stuff. So I got in the car and I headed to that young man's house, not knowing what in the world I would say or what in the world I would do when I got there. I prayed to God that he would help me, give me the words. When I arrived at his house, I'll never forget this, I got out of the car and I began to walk up the driveway and that young man ran down the driveway toward me and tears flowing down his cheeks, of course. He fell into my arms, and he looked at me, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Coach, today I climb my mountain. Listen, folks, we will all face our Mount Moriah, and I can't tell you what it is for you, and I can't tell you what you're going to go through. And today, if you're walking up a mountain of Coat and Isaac, I can't tell you that it's going to be easy. I can't tell you it's going to be pain-free. I can tell you this, though. God will provide. God will make a way 
when it seems like there is no way. And finally, God provides for his purpose. Abraham obeyed God even when it went against everything in him. And God honored that. Previously, we talked about the fact that the son said, he told the son that God will provide the lamb, and he does. Look at verse 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the arm, the ram rather, and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. This all sounds like a God story, doesn't it? Because it is. And I wonder how many times something that might seem like a, coincidence is really God providing. Albert Einstein once said, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. We see it all the time. God provides. When we least expect it, and we saw it never coming. So what happened here this day has been passed on, and God has received glory through the centuries. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by Myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, as the sand that's on the seashore. And what we need to remember is this. God does his best work when things seem helpless and things seem hopeless. And the reason because of that is that God is always working for his purpose. So we close this morning. I think the, the lesson for Abraham, the lesson for all of us is very simple. God always provides for us at the time of our greatest need. And our greatest need Jesus. On that day, there was a ram caught in the thicket. On that day, at Calvary, there was a lamb that hung on a cross. God provided for us. Jehovah Jireh. And the question for all of us is this, do you need Jesus? Do you need that provision in your life? Perhaps to surrender your life to him in obedient faith, confessing that faith and turning from your past and be baptized to have your sins washed away. Or maybe you need Christ in your life in a, in a real way that hadn't been there in some time. Whatever that need is, while you decide, let's all stand and sing. Raging through the storm, walking on the water, even when I could not see. In the middle of it all, where I thought you were a thousand miles away, not for a moment did you forsake.
morning when we woke up, many of us celebrated our mothers. Um, it's, it's, it's a joyous occasion for us to, to love on our mothers today and to think about our mothers for those who are not with us anymore. There's another reason for today. There's a reason that we're standing here or sitting here this morning reflecting back on the cross. We can celebrate that too. We can celebrate the fact that God saw fit to send his son. His son was willing to come to the cross. He was willing to stay on the cross. We can celebrate the fact that that tomb was found empty. So this morning as we take just a minute reflect back to that cross my prayer is that we do so in a way that is honorable and pleasing to our God so let's take just a minute reflect back and I'll lead us in prayer God, it cost you your son. 
We're thankful for the fact that you saw fit to send him. We're thankful for the fact that he was willing to go. Sometimes we don't understand it, but we're thankful. As we reflect back this morning on the price that was paid for our sins, we're mindful of the body that was shed. What it cost you. What it cost Christ. And we're thankful. Be with us this morning as we reflect back to the cross and partake of this bread that is a symbol to us of his body. Bless us as we partake of this bread this morning that we can do so in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. God, as we see Christ in our mind hanging on the cross, we see the blood that's flowing down from his side, from his head, from his hands, from his feet. To us as Christians, that blood represents cleanliness. To the world, that's confusing, God, because Blood is staining, but it covers our sin and allows us to stand justified in your sight. God, we pray that as we take a moment this morning to reflect back to the cross, we will see that blood. We will understand the significance of it, what it means for us as Christians, and the power that we have through it. Bless us this morning as we partake. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, those watching online and those, especially those that are here. And those that are watching online, I hope it won't be long before you'll be able to be with us. And Let's stand and we'll sing this song and we'll be, then we'll be dismissed in prayer. This is my daily prayer. God bless you. Go with God. Oh, bless his mighty hand throughout the day. His grace your heart sustains. His power
Father, we're so grateful to have been here this morning. We're so grateful for your presence among us as we've worshiped you. And as always, we just pray whenever we come together to worship you that you will touch our hearts, that our hearts will be focused on you, for on your son, on praising you and thanking you and uh, recognizing all the blessings that we have. And Father, we understand that you will provide. We ask that you would give us the faith that we need as we go about our lives to understand that, to not let the th cares of this world overtake us and weigh us down, but to have that peace and comfort that we can have in knowing that you love us and that you care for us. Be with us as we leave here this morning, as we go out into the world. Help us to use our lights to shine before men that they may see you and glorify you, see your good works in us and glorify you. Bless us in all that we do and help us to be the kind of children that you would have us to be. We pray all these things through your son's name and all the church said, amen. amen.